Everybody, it's Ron Young from Little Caesar, and you're listening to Cobras and Fire. And remember, rock is not dead. Fuck it, let's get right into it. Um, I'm here with Ron Young, lead singer of Little Caesar. Uh, how was your fourth? Have the fireworks died down around LA there? Are you in LA? Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm outside LA about an hour. I have a farm, ranch, you know, horse ranch. So I'm out in a real rural area, and it was really calm. So more people shooting off their guns because it's a day that we can play around and okay. not ha- have people freak out. Um, <laughs> but it was pretty timid. But in L.A., man, this year was like a war zone. I it, saw the video you shared. Um, yeah. I got to tell you, it was kind of. I'm in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Just uh, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Yeah. Paul. Uh-huh. Um, and it was very similar here. I don't know if it was quite that bad, but like for the I don't know two weeks leading up to the fourth, and especially the fourth, you know, basically from ten to I don't know midnight at least, there was shit going on all the time. But that that was crazy. That video you shared. Yeah, no, it was absolutely insane. And then on top of that. Because of the cover of the fireworks, you got all these people that are shooting off guns in their backyard or all around because, you know, the 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 noise kind of blocks. So people are trying out all their toys, and a lot of them they purchased, you know, during all the civil unrest. So it was just bedlam, you know, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. And the bullets come down eventually, don't they? <laughs> uh, they do, but I, I think most folks were just shooting them in their backyards at targets or into okay. wood blocks or whatever. But, you know, at, at least all my friends were <laughs> so, yeah, pretty crazy, you know, pretty crazy. You're, you're originally from New York. Is that right? Yeah. When yeah. did you head yeah, out I'm west? A, I came out to L.A. in like 84, 85. Um, you know, the New York music scene was turning all to hip hop and dance music. So more rock based stuff was happening on the West Coast. So yeah. I picked up and moved out here. You know, we've talked about that on the show a couple of times. There weren't a ton of bands to come out during the, that 80s kind of hard rock explosion from New York. I mean, like White Lion was one and uh, Skid Row kind of. Uh, right. But yeah, for the most part, everybody kind of moved west. So, I don't know. Yeah, no, it was the hotbed of people getting signed for rock bands was the Sunset Strip and Hollywood. So that's where everybody migrated to. Right on. Um, well, I mentioned that I, I'm a fan of your Facebook musings. Uh, so I have a question based on something you posted. Have you found time to take down the COVID decorations yet? I have not. You know, <laughs> I've got these little spiky Corona balls <laughs> hanging around the house, you know, and masks. You know, it, it's it's lovely decor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should ask, how is everybody at your house? Uh, everybody, it's healthy. You're doing well? Yeah, everybody's well. You know, um, my wife's, wife's been working out of the house. Um so, you know, years ago, you know, the attitude was, you know, leave me the fuck alone. And now that's called social distancing. So I was a pioneer in this concept yeah. many years ago. So hence why we bought a ranch and a farm and stay away from the general public because I was never a big fan to begin with. So no problem with that, you know, uh, but going out into the general public and seeing people's you know, behavior has been definitely an education and social engagement. No oh boy. And it's been absolutely nuts. The, so. um, I know you, you've commented on it, the, the face bat, the face mask revolt is, it's baffling to me. I, I, I'm having a hard time when you see some of these things. I don't, I don't, I haven't actually witnessed any of it firsthand, but you know, it, it's just well, unreal. I had this experience early on in this, my wife and I realized, you know, we, we have so many animals and we've got these pigs and it was easy for us to load up on horse, you know, on the hay for the horses, Mm -hmm. you know, because early on, you know, supply chain stuff was a problem. So for the pigs, I said, you know, listen, we got to go, I got to get all these canned vegetables and all the stuff, stuff that they eat so that just like us, if, if things get really weird and crazy, not knowing what's going to, this going to turn into, so I stocked up. So anyway, I'm at the supermarket wearing my mask and I got all this stuff and behind me are these, these two guys, you know, the sort of, let's call them uh, overt patriots, you know, and they're kind of making fun. So they're saying things like, oh yeah, man, look at all these snowflakes loading up on their stuff. Like it's the end of the world. And, 
you know, all I'm going to do is if it gets really bad is I'll just, you know, I'll just lock and load and go shopping at other people's houses. So I turned around. Oh, I'm like, you know, hey, fucker, let me give you my address. Come on by. <laughs> you know, this, this little snowflake, I can group it four inches from 100 yards. I'd be happy to. And he was like, oh. I was like, yeah, man, watch what you say and who you say it to. You know, it's just like this attitude. And, and unfortunately, this is the worst possible thing at the worst possible time with our current political situation. There's so much divisiveness that a lot of this stuff becomes, you know, medicine and protocol becomes a political statement. And I don't think <laughs> the two overlap very well for, for a good response. And we're starting to see that. And I, like you said, I don't get it. Um, it it's uh, putting on a mask to me is not tyranny. I'm sorry. It's just not, you know, and, and especially because I, I get this, there's a, there's a definite, consensus among all my musician friends that you know it's like we're like at the bottom of the food chain of mm -hmm. things that are going to open up you know i mean like 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 the pubs in the uk they just opened up on friday and their governmental policy is you can't play any loud music because it forces people to speak louder and therefore spit more and it's like right. everything that's bad about this virus completely destroys a, a live music venue, you know, in an intimate setting. And I mean, so many guys I know, man, they're like, what are we going to do? How are they, first of all, how are these businesses going to survive through this, these clubs who are struggling to mm -hmm. begin with? And then even when it does get better, there's still going to be, especially now with all the calling things fake news and not believing this and contradictory information there. And it's people that just, especially in our age demographic, which is older, you know, and this virus hits people that are older, harder than young people. And none of that looks good to help support something that was struggling to begin with. So I, I don't know how this is going to play out. It's really kind of sad and scary. And unfortunately, you know, the virus doesn't care about if you lean left or right or mm -hmm. who you support. Or it is what it is. And right now, between a bunch of kids going, I don't want to, you know, kids, meaning 20 something year olds, you know, they said in L.A., 500,000 people went out to the bars the first night that they opened them. Wow. And it's like, that's not good, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And it's it's just, you know, we're starting to see the results of all that kind of stuff and how it's going to play out. I don't know, man, but it's it's a really crazy time. Uh, have you been uh, in, ingesting bleach during any of this time? No, no, no. You know, I, I save all my <laughs> hypodermics for for other cleaning products. OK. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm more of a Mr. Clean guy, you know. Well, try this. I like to, <laughs> I like to throw a little splash in with my cucumber water. Uh, nice yeah you know nice just a, cocktail yeah. it's like a, yeah yeah it's a margarita yeah there you go <laughs> oh man um i lost my train of thought there yeah uh, well you did a nine point thing kind of breaking down what you were just talking about uh with uh these are the things that are going to have to change before live music and touring can come back we actually went point by point on that. Uh, we did a COVID kind of uh, 19 episode, and, and we talked about how it's affecting podcasting, which is not at all. Me and the guy I co-host it with live in two different cities. No, we, we thought it was actually well-written, and, and we, we kind of talked about and discussed everything you went through. And it's difficult to debate it because you, you, you don't just kind of point out the, the, the problems, but you got into detail with each one. I just, I don't know, kudos on that. You, you, also, thanks for the show material. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, it, it was just a little forethought and, and using common sense and, and science and, and you know, all of that. And when you add it all up, it's just, it's really not good. And there's a lot of people that want to be in denial about that stuff. And it, it's it's just the reality. And sure enough, it's playing out exactly mm -hmm. as I saw it. And, you know, I was a biology major, so I, I have a background in, 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 in a lot of this stuff. And it, it just, it's just common sense. And I, I don't see – it's not getting better. Um, and even in places that are – 
you know, in all these other countries that have gotten a handle on this thing, or, or even like in New York City, you know, mm. they're down to from a thousand deaths a day, they're down to nine. Right. They still don't have indoor dining, let alone cl- nightclubs going on and loud music and people congregating. And, you know, right, it's been four months. They were the first, they were kind of the first ones in the front lines of this yeah. and having to install these policies and see the results. And what shocks me is that in, in those places, there's direct proof that, that this kind of approach works and people are still just kind of writing it off. And it's like, you're just going to make this worse. I don't understand it. And I post this all the time. I use this. That there's a great quote by Winston Churchill. And back in World War II, he said, you can always trust America to do the right thing after they've tried everything else <laughs> and it's very appropriate and it's part of our american spirit mm. uh, but i think at this point that personality trait as a society is not really helping us so i, I couldn't agree more i mean do you remember i assume you paid you, you seem like a guy who pays attention to this i mean the florida governor being all smug and cocky about this shit when it was oh, bad in yeah. new york yeah. No, no, like, now look at your state now, asshole. I, yeah, exactly. And they're still in denial about it. Yeah, That's the thing the that shocks me. It's like, no, no, no. Just label stuff fake news and don't believe the data. They come up with a – it's like, well, look, the mortality rate's not going up. It's like, well, look, let's look at that in three weeks. Do you understand the cycle right. of, yeah. of an explosion? People uh, don't just walk in and die and then – You know, all these people going back to the look. One study says hydroxychloroquine helps people when they're really sick. And it's like, okay, first thing about that is it's one study and there's 10 other studies that say no. Our own government that's in charge, both the NIH and the FDA, say it's been banned. And then lastly, the president was talking about taking it as a preventative that's like going to your doctor and saying, listen, I'm worried about getting cancer. Can we start doing some chemo now? Does it prevent it? That's ridiculous. Well, so, bleach makes him nauseous, so he was looking for something well, else. Oh, that's the thing. He's <laughs> got to find non-invasive bleach. Uh, oh, yeah, exactly. Ugh. That's what that's the, the, what winds up being. That's like our leader. The, the, that's our leader. That is the guy in charge that refuses to, to change course, that refuses to back down, that refuses to admit, you know, that, that he judged this wrong. That's OK. I mean, yeah. as, I, I think honestly, as I mean, beings, it's unknown, it's novel. We, right. As human beings, we'd be way more open minded and empathetic saying, hey. This is a, you know, this is a complicated and a crazy thing. And you made some choices and you realized it wasn't working and you changed course. We're right behind you, man. We're right behind you. Let's, as a country, we need to do this. But instead, double down on the division, double down on calling it all BS. And we're seeing, we're seeing the, the ramifications and the results of that. And I don't know when, I mean, you even see guys like the, the Texas Governor Abbott, you know, he's he's now going, yeah, well, we kind of screwed up. Everybody put your masks on. And, you know, one by one, even Mitch McConnell now is saying yeah. stuff. And then Pence is even – and it's all going to eventually turn around. But, you know what, how many, how many people have to get ill and die, you know? I mean, it's amazing to me how easy it is for people to just look at this death toll and write it off as just kind of being acceptable. And throw up your hands and and it's, you know, listen, there's so many other countries that have proven that you can keep this down to a minimum. And these are human beings, man. This is not just a number on a sheet of paper. This is fellow citizens. And by feeding them a bunch of bullshit so they go out and go against their own interests and potentially open themselves up to, you know, serious illness. And there's... You know, people think you get it and get over it, but people that get it badly are are damaged for life. Their lungs are damaged for life and other tissue is damaged for life. And it's and then the other thing is, is they're finding that there is no real immunity. So this whole idea of trying to get herd immunity is Mm -hmm. not going to happen because the immunity only lasts for a few months, like a cold or something. And if that so I don't know, man, but here I am like 
everything I love is being threatened by this. And it just makes me really angry because it, you know, it started out with, okay, well, we got to cancel all these weekend runs we were going to do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll do what you got to do. Let's be smart. Let's be responsible. Let's cancel all that. It's like, and then we were supposed to, you know, go over to Europe for a month in September. And now they don't even let us in the country. And <laughs> people think it's like, you know, the day before you leave, you just go, okay, we're good to go. Come on, pack everything up. Let's go. It takes months of planning and preparation. Sure. And here we are already in July and it's not going to change. It keeps going up. So we're going to have to announce that we can't do it. And people are going to be bummed out. And, but then you show up and go and it's like, what, you get 30 people allowed in a room. And this, this country is one way. That country is one way. This city is one way that just like it is here. Mm-hmm. And it's just impossible to run a business like that as well as enjoy it. You know, <laughs> it's just nothing but stress. You wake up every day in the hotel room and after you've sprayed everything down with alcohol and go down and get coffee and wash your hands and wear a mask and then get in the van. And every time you got to stop for gas, you got to disinfect everything. And then you get to the show and you tell people, no, don't come any closer. And, you know, you can't, you're at the merch booth with like, you know, ropes around. It's just all so much stress and so much mental energy. And it's, it's just supposed to be entertainment and fun and, it's it's everything that you know everything gets taken away from that when you constantly have to worry about whether you're going to get infected with a virus you know it's it's just it's just insane man we live in crazy times and it's an industry that uh doesn't really have a lot of compassion from our leaders either there's you're basically no, you're it's an the bottom of the food you know? chain yeah. man <laughs> I mean, there's there's people that aren't working in in, in clubs across this country. I mean, there. I mean, even the bigger shows. If you want to talk about that, yeah, I mean, you know more than anybody. Riggers, uh, the lighting, the road crews, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, all the all all of the all of the support stuff, all the crew. And you know, the interesting thing is, it's like, you know, this is kind of insider kind of you know stuff. But like, Live Nation came out and made that announcement that. You know they're the biggest the biggest concert promoter in the U.S. Mm-hmm. and now they're dumping the liability on the artists. It's not yeah, about they can, the they can go out of business as far as I'm concerned. If you want to get into that, <laughs> yeah, I I agree. Um, that whole ticketing you know, industry is just a fucking shit show. It's it is a total middleman scam bullshit. And mm-hmm. um, you know and and they you know so they're the ones that put on these shows and run these tours and these bigger venues and. They've dumped the liability in the artists, and I know some larger artists whose management's gone in and started calling up some of these insurance companies to get their band a policy to cover them from any claims, you know? Right. And, and nobody, even Lloyds of London, who will, you know, basically <laughs> insure, they'll insure anything if you pay them a, a big enough yeah. rider, you know, enough oh, fee, shit. but they won't cover it. And so... How are bands going to go out there and run a concert? And, and, you know, especially in America, people love lawsuits. Oh, I went to the concert and it's you're responsible because they didn't socially distance and people were spitting on me and screaming and you got me sick with COVID and start a lawsuit. You get two mm-hmm. or three of those and they'll take millions of dollars to defend it. And nobody can take that chance. And on top of it, they're now not even giving out guarantees. They're doing this. Well, hey. As the promoter, we can't take a chance that people aren't going to come. So we're going to do a door deal, you know, 60, 40 split, you know, and it's like, okay, well, we might sell a thousand tickets. We might sell 300 tickets. We might sell a hundred. You can't book your crew and your travel and your buses and you can't do all that and roll the dice on a, on a financial gamble like that. It could bankrupt the band. Right. So it's it's all so sad and and like you say we right now have an administration that doesn't seem to support the arts or feel that that's something that they need to back as much as a financial firm so there's no guarantees on that or or, you know financial safety valves uh the uk just announced that they're going to have a two billion dollar fund for theater and music and arts and 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 music venues to help them you know, try to sustain. And so at least, at least that country realizes that it's an essential thing to the social and cultural order of a country. And here it's just like, nah, screw them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really bad. It really is. Um, and 
Let's lighten it up a little bit. I think uh, we, we've uh, gotten serious <laughs> enough for the listeners. There's plenty of COVID information out there. I, I, by the way, I, I, I joke, but I really appreciate your candor and, and, and sharing your thoughts on all that stuff. We do kind of get into the business stuff a lot on this show, and it, it's, it's something that we at least we find fun to talk about. But I'd like to circle back on something that you mentioned a little while ago, because one of the things I did wonder is like what, what someone in your position does to keep busy uh, when they're not doing Little Caesar, because, you know, Little Caesar isn't probably a full-time job at this stage of your life. But you have a ranch. Yeah. No, I mean, this is Little Caesar. We learned years ago to turn it into a spiritual journey. You know, one of the spirit, not one of the wallet. So we we work our careers and lives around the touring schedule that we do, and which opens it up for us to be more of, you know, if we make money, great. If we break even, great. If we lose money, well, ah, shit, that sucked. But we don't, this is not what we count on to pay the mortgages. But for me, you know, I never thought I'd be an avocado rancher and run a horse ranch and build a horse ranch. That's back on. Av- you have, av- you're not an avocado farmer. Yes. I, I have Shut the fuck avocado up. trees. I do, man. I grow fucking avocados. And the crazy thing is that I don't even like avocados. <laughs> I mean, I've grown avocados for four years. They take out semis full of these things. I've never even eaten one of them. So <laughs> oh, my God. Well, you, you, yeah. How do I tell if an avocado is ready at a grocery store? <laughs> I, 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 you know what? Ask somebody who gives a fuck. I, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I have a consultancy with Mission Avocados, a big, huge. They come out and they look at my trees. They go, eh, we'll be out in two weeks to come pick them. It's like, okay, great. In the meantime, I, I've gotten good at the fertilizing. I've gotten good at pest, yeah. pest debatement. I've gotten good at all that. Other than that. I didn't I even know pest did. debatement was a thing. Yes, yes. Well, we have these things called thrips, which is a parasite that attacks the leaf of the avocado tree. Mm. And uh, I, this coming out of my mouth is a voice inside my head going, how did you get this place in your life? How did you uh. get here? You know, I thought I'd be building motorcycles and cars, which I did for a while. That was all fun. But, you know, it just got to the point where we you, were. I, real quick, Ron, I get that same yeah. voice anytime I'm in Bed Bath & Beyond with my wife. Uh-huh. Bed Bath & Bankrupt. I'm the same <laughs> way. There's a part of me where my skin is crawling, feeling like I completely. Like, what the fuck did I do that end up right, here? Exactly. Like I'm a traitor to my code. <laughs> You know, it's like, I hope nobody gets a picture of me standing by the espresso machines and it, with my wife asking me, do you like this color of towel or this color? I'm like, I don't give a fuck. The pain is real. <laughs> the pain is real. But yeah, I interrupted so you. Just, you also have horses and pigs. Yes, I've got horses, donkeys, pigs, dogs. I've got um, four dogs, four cats, um, two co- huge koi ponds. Uh, four horses, too many donkeys, two potbelly pigs, and it is a constant, constant thing with vets and mm. moving them from pasture here to the barn there and build this and repair that. And it's a full time job. And so the animals are more pets. Uh, they're not like your livestock or anything like that. Nature? No. Oh God, no, no. My wife won't. My wife doesn't eat pork anymore. As soon as she got pigs for pets, <laughs> and in fact, she nearly killed me one day because I was eating a ham sandwich and she was so angry at me. And she's like, "How could you eat? We own pigs." I'm like, "I'm not slaughtering my pigs. These are some. I know it's hypocrisy. I get it." But and then I pulled off a piece of ham and I fed it to the pig and he loved it. And <laughs> I'm like, "See, even the pigs like pork." And she, oh man, she was furious at me. She was throwing stuff at me, but I made, my, I made my point. So, you know. Uh, well, so at least you got you got have I all think. that to kind of keep you busy during this kind of lockdown, or it's not really a lockdown oh, anymore. Yeah. But I, and that's been my life. I mean, I we bought this property and I built a house from the ground up, and we lived in this little house while I was building the main house, and that's kind of been twenty four seven, all consuming with county permits and contractors and you know, building this and fixing that and designing this. And that's just been all consuming for the last like five years. So, you know, but we built this place. It's beautiful. A couple of my friends, kids got married here. Oh, nice. So yeah, that was cool. We had music going, and, you know, so that was cool, but that's kind of been what I do. So it keeps me away from having to, to, to engage the general public other than going to home Depot and, 
buying supplies and my sure. mask and you know the usual kind of stuff but and yeah. and did you ever get into bike building were you doing it at some point you mentioned that yeah kind of i was as doing a... that i had a custom metal business and i was doing this cool kind of ornamental um really off the wall kind of um fencing and art pieces and it, it, i really had to find like i did a whole that Kristen stewart chick you know the actress yeah um I did a couple of her properties and her mom's properties. Her mom's a director in the film business and they're, you know, the whole family is like tatted up and have hot rods and they're all into um, Alice in Wonderland. They're like obsessed with the Alice in Wonderland stuff. So I did all this fencing and they got, it got two hundred percent wolves from the U S government that, that were rescued that, we're getting out of their backyard and eating the neighbor's dog. So how to build eight foot fencing. And so that was like two years of my life was working for them and, and doing all their stuff and building cars and hot rods and stuff for myself and, and, you know, for friends doing, you know, chop tops and all that kind of fabricating stuff. I did that for a while. And then, you know, the economy took a dump and that whole business went down and that's when I shifted to, okay, I'm just going to buy a property and develop it and build it up. And because we were living over in the Kardashian neck of the woods. And when they moved in, man, all of a sudden the Justin Bieber's and all these other douchebags started moving into the neighborhood. And you're like, <laughs> we, got, we got to get out of here, man. This is turning into, you know, hip hop party central. Um, so we moved down, like, let's get it. Let's get a real farm. So we got 20 acres. And I'm, yeah, I'm out in the middle of farmland. I'm around citrus growers and now hemp growers and, you know, all this stuff. And I can, you know, I can shoot my guns and yell all I want, rip around on my quad, you know, and then just zip into town when I need civilization. So, yeah, right on. Great. Yeah. Cool. I, I, if it's all right, I'm going to move in with you. Um, but uh after my di- my divorce, of course. I, I, if, well, hey, keep going to Bed Bath and Beyond. That'll happen quick. <laughs> <laughs> I love my wife. I, I just have to clarify that in case she actually listens to one of my podcasts. No, listen. That's why we go to Bed Bath and Beyond. That's what I tell her. I look at her. And she's like, you know, you're being such a dick. I'm like, I'm a dick. I'm standing in Bed Bath and Beyond with you. Nothing says I love you more mm. than I'm willing to go into a place like this and actually spend time. I think that, that there's no greater statement of love and commitment that you'd put yourself through that experience. She generally gets it. So No, oh, yeah, my wife too. Uh, but I'm going to use that. Uh, uh, well, that car on your Facebook, your, your background, the, the, that, is that yours, I assume? Or? Yes. Yeah, what, that's what, a kind, 19, what, what car that's is that? That's a 41 Buick Super 8. I picked it up out in Minnesota. Ooh, nice. Drove it home. And yeah, chopped the top off it and airbagged it and clipped it, put a V8 in it. And every every exposed piece of metal is copper plated and then clear coated, so it's all black and copper. Hmm, and cool. yeah, that's one of the, one of that was a two year project in the driveway that my wife hated because I shut down my metal shop, so I had to do it in the front yard. And it's really funny because we sold that place, and the guy I sold it to, who was actually another artist kind of guy, he's like, "What's this?" orangey red rusty square in the driveway and i'm like well <laughs> that's the ghost of my car because that's where the car was parked and every time i was chopping and welding little tiny bits of iron were falling into the concrete and rusting and i tried to throw muriatic acid on it and everything i couldn't and i just was like you know what it's just kind of burned it's like a brand it burned its square into the into the concrete and it's still there it's really funny that's cool so yeah. Uh, Monsters of Rock Cruise has been doing a lot of these uh, Facebook Live yeah. concerts that are just killer. And I watched your guys. I oh, uh, loved it, by the way. Uh, how is all that stuff coming together? Like, I mean, do you know anything about how they put it? I mean, it's all on the same stage, but it looks amazing and it's a real fun to watch. Yes. it's they. You know what? They're, they're being really innovative. They brought in some great, you know, the video wall concept, which really makes it visually great. And they got Claire Brothers audio involved for the mixing. And so really really smart it's in a small room it's kind of intimate you know a little bit of social distancing going on but it's more not so many people there they got a great team of people um trying to be innovative and groundbreaking seeing that some new technology is going to have to step in here to bring music to people 
and they did a really great job and they're bringing all these bands in and they're keeping it going and um give them a lot of credit for doing that um the cruise is still scheduled and it looks like it's going to happen so we're excited for next about year. that yeah in in um in february so hopefully things will be calmed down maybe it'll have to postpone it a bit i don't mm-hmm. know but according to the insiders there they're still planning on doing it and you know so we're keeping our fingers crossed you know it's like all this stuff um keep our fingers crossed hope for the best expect the worst especially with the way it's going these days but it's so far it's looking good so hopefully by february it'll be calmed down uh, any chance they're going to get the Dio hologram to do a Facebook live show? <laughs> that would be great. Yes. Um, we get a, a whole, <laughs> yeah. Hologram, a bunch of bands for the play. <laughs> you guys wouldn't have to so, show up. <laughs> for, for right. If they don't show up or if they can't sing anymore. Hey, hologram concerts are perfect for right now. Yeah. That, that actually, I, I guess, you know, People laughed at that. Maybe now they're going to start taking a second look at it going, you know, that's a pretty cool idea. Are you, are you a fan? Oh, God, no. Okay. No, I, I, it's, you know, they're, they're, there's so much in this business, man, that, uh, listen, I, I'm in this place where I do this for fun and mm-hmm. I do this. And when it gets to the point, I, I'm, I'm my own biggest critic. When I can't hit the notes anymore and I can't speak the words and I, whatever, then then it's time to hang it up. And and I get there's a lot of guys that this is this is the way that they make their living. But I'm not going to name any names. People have seen the videos. But, dude, if you can't do this anymore, stop taking people's money and playing on their – I mean, people want to relive the passion of their youth. Right. I get it. When you've been around for 20, 30, 40 years or whatever, people are going to be loyal and show up. But when it gets to be that pathetic that you, you make the audience sing half your songs with the mic sticking out, hey, sing along, it, it's just time to hang it up. We know and, you're talking about I, Vince Neil. You know, you're yeah, someone like Vince. <laughs> it, even, even David Lee Roth, I, I've seen the videos, not yeah. very good. And uh, Stephen Piercy, a lot of that is self, you know, self-inflicted. He still look. It, it, it word has it, and from the videos, being totally hammered. And okay, he's, he's got a bad back. I got a bad back. I've been sober, you know, twenty, twenty-two years. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's no real good excuse about that. But I don't know, man. I just think it hurts. It hurts the whole music industry. And I get it. You know, this this rusted metal genre is is kind of hanging on, but. Right. I don't know, man. Go go to the gym, lose some weight, get yourself back in shape, sing the songs that you can sing, but don't go out there and be half in the bag and huffing and puffing and not singing the notes. I, I just don't think it does the whole the whole thing any good. And and I get that there's people that are gonna love him no matter what. Then then let that legacy go and you know it's it's basically an insult to guys guys like me that you know i i you still sound great gym. ron i go to the gym and i take care of myself and you know i i do do the work still that so i can sing my songs and if i can't then i'm not gonna go out there and make make a fool of myself you know well, and I'll share this with you. Uh, our listeners have heard me talk about this. My opinion on this stuff is that why do you need more? Especially like, um, Ron, I'm a big Kiss fan. And it's been my whole life, and I really don't care for what they're doing now. Um, I'm not going to get into detail there, but the point being is that like Kiss gave me enough. I I got everything I ever wanted. Why do I, I? I only want good. I want good to great. I don't need mediocre to re- – there's videos I can go watch. You know what I mean? If right. I really want to and, celebrate yeah, and that. And to go out there and lip sync to tracks and all that sort of stuff that these bands are doing now. I mean, I won't name any names, but we Paul bumped Stanley. into it. Well, yeah, there's Paul and, and there's <laughs> other people. I'll name names is all I'm saying. That. Yeah, I mean, there's other bands. He ain't that, taking my calls that, anyway. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and there's other guys doing that too. You know, they had a rough night, or you know, listen, they have to do five shows a week rather than three because yeah. they 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 can't take the downtime. They got to have revenue nights every night, and so they'll when they're having a week night, they hit the track and they sing. They hide, you know, behind the microphone, and it's just like really, it's gotten to this point. This is just I don't understand. Is it, is it an ego thing? It's Paul Stanley and those guys, they don't need the money. 
They're, they're, yeah. they, they could retire and be fine. So it's not about the money. I think that they don't, I don't know if they don't, they just love the experience, but it's not even the real experience, but they've been doing this for years. When we toured with them, they had the backstage keyboard player doubling Paul's parts and hitting all the vocal samples. They had that years back, mm -hmm. but they were still playing and singing for real. Right. You know, they were just supplementing, augmenting, for, for this, for augmenting to make a better show. And, and I respect that, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, I think almost anybody I, can be okay with that. I don't like it when Gene Simmons comes out and bags on other people for doing what he's doing. Cause that's, <laughs> that's hypocrisy. But uh. if you're going to do it and just keep a low profile about it and still for the predominance, be playing your instruments and singing your songs, just thickening it up and making it more exciting sonically okay that, that's show business but it's getting to the point now it's just a cancer on the whole thing and when you add all this kind of stuff up man it's just getting to the point that that you're you're killing this and the legacy of this especially now with the virus who's gonna who's gonna go stand in a room with a whole bunch of people who are not wearing a mask or not doing what doesn't look like they're taking it seriously to see a band that the guy can't even sing half the songs and I mean, Jesus, would you risk your life for that? No, <laughs> the, the entire state of Florida would. Yes, they would. Yes, <laughs> it, it, it seems that way and deny it. No, no, 90 percent of the people are going to be fine. Uh, right. Yeah, 99. Well, before we uh, get too far away from the Monsters of Rock cruise, have you guys done that before? No, we haven't. You so know, this is your first time. Huh? All right. I hear great things and, and I hear great things from the bands. I mean, that's kind of what really made us try to you know get on it was that all the guys in the bands are saying man they treat you so good and it's a whole lot of fun and because I, I don't drink anymore so getting on and i don't like cruises um i don't like the general public i get claustrophobic okay. all this kind of stuff and so I'm you like, probably won't be out mingling wanna, huh Levi, why would I want to get on a boat for like six days and be forced around a whole bunch of drunk people that you know, and everybody in the band's like, dude, it's not like that. It's not like that. It's really cool. The fans are really cool. People don't get too drunk. Um, they really, really, they, you know, the, the crews, you know, the people behind the scenes, they make it a great experience. And I was like, well, okay, great. So we kind of reached out to them and it took us a couple of years to get the invite. And then we finally got it this year. And of course, you know, now we got this thing going on, but um, they've been really, really gracious to us. We were really grateful that they asked us to do the, the monsters rock studios thing. I mean, we were kind of bummed. It was on a Sunday on father's day, but that was just the roll of the dice. You right. know? So, but yeah, they're, they're really great. And you know, when you, when you bump into people like that, who are working really hard to keep this thing going and they do it well and they do it, you know, w with, with a passion. Um, it's a successful event, you know? And so, you know, when I see guys, you know, all these groups of business people that are taking it in the ass right now because of this, it's really a shame because there are people that really yeah. make stuff top notch and, and a really great experience. And it isn't about, just about the money it's about you know keeping the passion alive for this and putting it all into one sort of package that everybody can really appreciate so uh, i hope that it goes off and i hope that it stays strong because we need stuff like that you know one thing you uh promoted recently or at least some news i got through you on your facebook page that uh as of two months ago, I wouldn't have known what the hell you were talking about, but as of about seven weeks ago, I did. And that's that Manic Eden is actually going to be released. And if I understood your post right, it's never been released in the United States. Never been released in the States. You know, that whole thing was so bizarre. You know, I, when I got the phone call from Adrian back in like 94, and he was like, listen, we're trying to do this thing, you know, because remember, this is in the heat of the grunge thing and mm -hmm. hair metal and all that stuff was really. You said it was 94? Yeah, yeah okay. I think so. If, like if my foggy brain remembers. Yeah, yeah. That I was, was just trying to set the scene for the listener. It doesn't yeah. have to be perfect. Right. So it was, you know, in, in the whole grunge rage and, and hair metal and that kind of stuff was not getting the support. So Adrian had some downtime. He had this idea of doing a project with Rudy Sarzo and Tommy Aldridge, basically Whitesnake with a new singer. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to originally be with James Christian since, uh, um, from House of Lords. Oh, really? That didn't work. Yeah, that didn't work out. And they wanted it more bluesier. So they called me up. We did the record. It was initially the deal was through JVC in Japan. 
And Adrian and his manager were smart enough to keep the distribution rights for Europe and the U.S. open. So they basically paid to get the record done. And we did the record and we started shopping it around to labels in the States. And they would, didn't even, wouldn't even listen to it. It yeah. was like, no, we don't, we don't put this stuff out on majors anymore. It's only grunge type stuff, Seattle stuff. And we were kind of shocked. And then it came out on SPV in Europe. And at that point, you know, we'd spent so many months doing this. And Adrian and those guys, they were they were already functional adults at that point. And they couldn't just sit around waiting for something to happen. And so um, Adrian went back and started working with David Coverdale again. And it just kind of fell apart. So we put that record out. And it, it, it did well in Japan. And, you know, the Europe stuff was kind of had a half-assed promotion behind it. And then nothing really happened. And so now I just hear that they're going to re-release it and uh you know hey it's always exciting when somebody's gonna re-release what you did and it was such a fun project to do and you know i i count working with those three guys as one of the highlights of of my professional career you know getting to work with such legends i was the i was the the cheap man in the in the bunch <laughs> with, the, with the low draw value and marquee value compared to those guys so um you know, it was uh, really just a great experience, uh, especially in, and over time, listening to the record, it was just like a sort of progressive blues project. And yeah. it's kind of timeless and um, it was really fun to do. And, and I, I, I'm excited that they're putting it out again. So, yeah, I, I heard a song on a podcast called In Obscuria, like I said, about, I don't know, just under two months ago. And I reached out. I'm friends with the host of it. I just said, hey, do you have that whole record? Because I can't find it anywhere. Right. Um, and so he's sent me a copy of it. And I, I, I've listened to it a couple times. I think it's fucking great. And then yeah, to see, it's a good see it's coming out, man, that's great news. Yeah, no, it, it is. It, 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 it won't go away. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so my yeah, theory was, was it, that uh, Rudy Sarzo and Adrian Vandenberg, like they, they've worked with almost everybody. It, it seemed like the, the, that whole project came together because it was just your turn. But it, uh, it it sounds like I'm wrong that you are actually pulled in later. Yeah, no, it, 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 <laughs> it started out being this one concept, and I, I I think that when they started to put it together, it was really early on, and they were trying to feel out how they would how they would evolve out of being this sort of grandiose because the production is real intimate compared to all the. You know, you listen to a white snake record, it's it's big production, you know. Yeah. And they wanted to go for a more stripped down thing. And it took a while for them to kind of formulate because I remember when we were working in the studio, every time AGM would do a solo, it was really thought about, you know, because he can shred mm -hmm. and he could be the fast Steve Vai type, you know, in that sort of more genre. And he wanted to keep things more Stevie Ray, Jimi Hendrix, pay, pay homage to his, his influences, yet still be Adrian Vandenberg. And so he put a lot of thought and energy into that. And I think he did a really great job sort of um, adapting for that project and making the statements that he wanted to make with the freedom that he had. And um, it's just a shame that we never got to really – really perfect it and develop it and let it evolve and turn it into what it was going to be because it was, you know, for those guys, they were kind of getting tired of the big giant grandiose Rudy licking his bass with the Tyro <laughs> going off. And, oh, he doesn't do know, that in the studio. Just like, do I, do I, no, we, we used to tease, we used to tease them all the time about this stuff. They're, they're really great guys. They're so down to earth. You know, <laughs> this is the, it's just, you know, as, as, as the decades go on, you know, you find out who are the douchebags and who are the really great guys, guys who get it. They, they, their love for the music and their credibility and their professionalism and the, what kind of content they have as a human being makes them just such a pleasure to work with and stay connected to. And so as the years have gone on, you know, me and Adrian poke fun at each other and Rudy too on, on, on social media now that that's there. But like Rudy, he does so much great work for Animal Rescue and Adrian's this incredible painter and he's got Moon Kings and he's got, you know, Vandenberg record that just came out, debuted yeah. at number one in Japan. So it, it warms my heart when I see guys like that, you know, staying incredibly, you know, passionate about their work and evolving and still having a career and, a, and an outlet to do what they're born to do. So it's fun. It's fun to watch from, from the periphery to see, see my friends kind of, 
you know, go through their lives and evolve and become even better people than, than in our youth, you know? Right on. You know, before I shift to little Caesar, let me ask you one question that just kind of popped into my head. Um, you're a great singer. Were there any other bands of note? Like maybe Motley Crue was looking for a singer on this time. Were you ever like approached by anybody no, else? No, was n- never approached. You know, this is the funny thing. My, my almost made it. Back in 1986, I replaced Anthony in the Chili Peppers for a couple of months. Shut up. I swear to God, we, we we went into Capitol Records. Anthony was in rehab. They didn't think he was going to get his shit together. It was Hillel and and Flea and you know, Jack Irons playing drums at the time. And it was for the Uplift Mofo Party Plan. Record. Okay. And I had written all melodies and lyrics. They wanted to get more of a singer and less of like a rapper kind of guy because mm-hmm. Anthony technically is not a very strong singer. No, I get it. He's, yeah, he's got his yeah. style. So but yeah. they wanted to, to – so I wrote that record and we rehearsed and pre-produced it and started to do demos. And by that time, Anthony had come out of rehab and sat down with the band and they you know, kissed and made up and he's been sober ever since and – and um, actually it's the best thing that ever happened to that band is yeah. to keep Anthony because it, it, that's just, he's just the chili peppers, him and Flea are just the chili peppers. So it was that. And then I was supposed to do Slash's. Are there any recordings of that around? Of you working with them? You or? know what? I used to have a cassette of the demos that we did. And when I got divorced in my first marriage, it went. Uh, the box went into storage and disappeared. You wouldn't and, go to Bed Bath and Beyond, I bet. No, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that disappeared, and so I don't have any record of that, any of the music. Um, it was it was actually pretty funny. Some of the songs were actually pretty hysterical. They let me kind of kind of have free reign, and there was a lot of funny tongue in cheek, off the wall kind of crazy shit that went along with okay. wearing socks on stage. And then and then in the early 90s, when Slash was doing his Snake Pit thing, I was supposed to be the singer in that. Oh, a, that would have been amazing, a, Ron. Yeah, he, he had auditioned I wish you were now singers. And I got this phone call one day from Mike Klink going, so what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, we're doing nothing. Caesar's broke up. I'm just, he's like, well, um, Slash can't find a singer, and I think you'd be perfect for this. Mm-hmm. And he's like, would you like to get together? I'm like, of course, man. So he's like, well, he's doing a really weird thing. He go up to his house and he plays you some music. And right there on the spot, you write melodies and lyrics and he records it. And he goes, are you up for that? Is that intimidating? I'm like, no, man, I'm, I'm willing to be totally spontaneous like that. So I went up and he really liked this stuff. And so we started working together. We worked together for like a month. Then the, the earthquake hit in 92 and it leveled his house mm. and not only leveled his house, but he had a room, one huge room full of snakes, but I'm talking like cobras, black mambas, like deadly venomous snakes. He had uh, like an 18 foot albino python that lived. He plexiglassed off underneath the staircase and that's where that lived. That came crashing down. All of these things, scorpions, they all got loose. And even Klaus? What's that? Even Klaus? Who's Klaus? Scorpions. Ah, yes. <laughs> that was a even bad Klaus. joke. Come on. Klaus, yes, 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 yes. yes. I, I'm, not, I'm not quick enough. My coffee is, I need another cup of coffee. Uh, sorry. But it, 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 so he dealt with all that. They red tagged his house and he, he, had, a, he had to rent a house. Anyway. So at the end of the thing, it just really came down. It was Mike and Nez. He was playing bass. And Mm. what happened was people were telling him, listen, you know, um, you really need to find a singer that's more like Axel. Because if Guns N' Roses is toast and you go out there, you're going to have to be doing all those GNR hits. And I'm like, dude, I don't sing like Axel. He's got that high nasally mask voice thing going on. And I'm more of a, you know, bluesy kind of warm thing i i can't even really fake that stuff right and so he decided to go with the guy from jellyfish and i i didn't think the songs were ready to go yet he was really rushed geffen was really pushing him to put out a record fast and um i remember he you know we used to have these sort of discussions with Mike Klink that we didn't think that the songs are really polished enough and ready to go and we should keep writing and all that. But he didn't, he put it out and it didn't, it didn't do huge business or anything, but it was really fun to work with him. And so that was another almost, you know, almost, you know, 
got my career really going again, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but it wasn't meant to be, but you know, again, like the chili peppers thing, no hard feelings, man. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, I, I really, I had a lot of, uh, empathy for what he was going through. He was getting pulled in a lot of directions, you know, all of this guns and roses, public battle was going on between mm -hmm. him and Axel and, he was just trying to make his music, man. Just trying to get his get back out there and get some music out there. And so he was really, he's a really sweet guy, a really talented guy. So I, I'm lucky that I got to work with him. I'm grateful for that. Well, with Little Caesar, uh, one thing that um, it's easy to say in hindsight that it was probably more timing than anything, but I, I, I really absorbed the, the, the debut record on, on uh, DGC Records. Uh, I ended up getting the EP, but it was that one record which was really my jam as far as getting into Little Caesar. I never liked the name Little Caesar. I, I just I, I felt I kind of held you guys back a little bit. How did that name come about? Do you agree? Am I just an well, idiot? Um, I don't think it was the name. You know, the, the funny. Well, thing I think is, you had timing now, but uh, at the, I remember feeling yeah, weird about no, it at the time. I, I, I mean, there was so many. Listen, all, my career has been. If you look up everything that could go wrong, <laughs> you know, phrase that's been my musical career. Nice. Um, we picked the name Little Caesar. Geffen never told us in, in California, there wasn't a national pizza chain with the, with the name. So we didn't even know about little Caesar's pizza. I got the name from the old Edward G Robinson film. I wanted something that was powerful, but it didn't take itself too seriously. So we picked that name. And then like literally three weeks before the record came out, the label's like, well, you know, there's a pizza chain. I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking pizza, about? Pizza, pizza. Right. And we're like, well, no, let's change the name. Let's no, no, the artwork's already done. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? It's like, well, let's call the band Domino's. I mean, <laughs> Dunkin Donuts. I mean, Pizza come Hut. On. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so we're like, oh, man, this is this is this is not good. And everything about that first record, you know, listen, we were really lucky that Right after we formed, we had huge amounts of interest. Jimmy Iving jumped in, became our manager. And John Kaladner jumped in to be the, you know, he wanted the A&R of the project. And it was such a huge battle of the egos. You know, it was, we just wanted to make a really stripped down, honest record. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting for producer. You know, Bob Rock had, got a fight, got into a fight with John Collada. We had to wait like a year and a half to do the record. Oh, really? So, yeah, we were just sitting around jerking off. So, anyway, we wanted to do more of like a Leonard Skinner, ACDC, Bad Company kind of a record. More, more organic, more honest, smaller production, you know. Because that was the look of the band. That was the attitude of the band. It was working class, honest you know, kind of thing. And Bob, I remember goes, your, your tattoos really stuck out visually. Like, cause that wasn't something that yeah, was quite as common at the more, time. There wasn't a million guys. Me and Tommy Lee used to laugh. We're like, dude, we're like the most tattooed guys in rock and roll. And then all <laughs> of a sudden, everybody like Roseanne and Cher, they're all getting tattoos from my artist. And it's like, Oh my God, this has become, you know, I got tattoos so people would stay away from me. And now I got soccer moms wanting to compare ink in the fucking produce section. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, God, this became totally social when it was supposed to be anti-social. But anyway, so Bob Rock says he wants to make that kind of a record. So we go up to Vancouver and we start making the record. And right as we're finishing off of the basic tracks, just as it's starting to come together, Motley Crue's record, Feel Good, goes to number one. Okay. And as soon as that happened, dude, the multi-track machine started coming in. We started to do 10 times the overdubs. All of a sudden, it started to become this big, out-of-control, overproduced record. And it was a huge battle. And at the end of the day, we kind of felt like the record wasn't really – didn't represent the band well. So here you have these, you know, sort of slicker-produced ballad-type tracks – and you look at the band and you think we're going to sound like Motorhead. And, <laughs> you know, and so they're like going, oh, well, you know, you're, you're too scary. And it's like, no, you made the music too safe. You made the music too slick. You took off all the honest edges that would make this picture look 
Correct. And then we're like, well, don't worry about it. The, the strength of the band and the songs, we got MTV behind us. And sure enough, you know, MTV said just, I didn't even want Chain of Fools on the record, let alone as the first single. Really? That, yeah, that was the first song we ever learned. Just to, as a proof of concept, I want to be a hard rock soul band. So we just started jamming on, on R&B covers and it just stuck with us. And Kalab, you know, like, no, we're going to make this the first single. And we're like, why? You know? And he's like, well, you know, Van Halen broke with their covers. And it's like, what does one thing have to do with the other? Right. And so we kind of fought the whole thing. And it just, you know, and then one thing after the, within within three weeks, the label got sold. So all of a sudden, the Japanese, as our record is on MTV in heavy rotation, our records can't be found in the stores because once David Geffen sold the label, it went from uh, WIA distribution to BMG distribution. So they didn't have computers and all that shit. So on that real products, quick, so you were, were, you, were you initially on Geffen and then DGC? Yes. First we were on Geffen, and then this was the pitch. They came to us and said, listen, we're starting up this new label just devoted to new bands. We've got three new artists that we're going to focus on for the beginning of this new label. There's Nelson who, you know, and we're like, okay. And they're, those whole guys, I, I remember having battles because they wouldn't shoot their video. They had to spend their own money to shoot a video because radio wouldn't play their record. And I'm like, make a video, get it on TV. Radio will follow suit once the 13 yeah. year old girls see these guys. And then they go, <laughs> and then there's you. And then there's this college indie band. They'll, they'll sell maybe 30,000 records. I They're know really who you're cool. talking about here. Name Nirvana. <laughs> So I heard that record. I'm like, 30,000 records? This thing's going to be huge. They're like, no, no, no. It's so weird and quirky and different. I'm like, that's what people want. They're sick of your bullshit of power ballad, rock track, teased hair. I mean, look at us, dude. We look like bikers. See, we get this. You guys don't get it. This shit's got to stop. You got to stop with this overproduced bullshit. And they didn't get it. And so the label gets sold, you know, so we get stuck on that label. Three weeks after that comes out, he sells the label. Two weeks after that, the the manager of the label, I won't say his name because he's sober now, the, he gets fired for masturbating on his secretary. <laughs> he gets a $2 million payout. Guy. She gets a $2 million payout. Nobody's running the label. So our records aren't in the stores. There's nobody running the ship. Then the Japanese come in and they find out that, yeah, there's Guns N' Roses and there's Little Caesar and there's Junkyard. And there's a, but they didn't realize that their label had 228 people signed to the label. So they're like, what are all these bands? And they're like, yeah, well, these are all the things we've signed. And they're like, Cut the budgets. We we even need to make these numbers look way better. Okay. Because David Geffen blew a bunch of smoke up their ass, got like over a billion dollars for the label. So they bring this other guy in, Robert Smith, who starts cutting every budget. No tour support, no video money, no nothing. So this all happens in a span of six, eight weeks. Wow. And everything just went into the shitter. And then the final coffin, nail in the coffin was David Geffen got into a fight with Jimmy Ivey. Jimmy's managing us. Jimmy decides he's been working for a year to start his new label, Interscope. So David Geffen comes to Jimmy and says, oh, by the way, um, I want you to do your distribution through, through, through our company. And Jimmy's like, fuck you. I'm not going to do business with you. I, I, I'm going to run my business how I want. I don't want to get in bed with you. Sorry, no offense, but just too, too big egos, too many arguments over the years. So David decides to be vindictive and says, well, okay, well, first of all, you can go, Lil C's can go fuck themselves. You know, this whole train wreck that went on during their first release, you know, forget it. And by the way, you can't work with him anymore because in the state of California, you can't be a record distributor and a manager. It's against the law. Okay. If you want to own Interscope, you got to stop managing Lil Caesar. So we had, we had to fire him. And we started working with Herbie Herbert. And I remember this distinctly. Herbie goes, well, I'm going to have a meeting with the label. Let's see if we can regroup on this. 
basically screw the first record. We'll come up with another record. Let's let's fall back and regroup. We got a new label now. We got all new people in place. The distribution shit's been worked out. Um, there's a whole bunch of markets still really excited about you guys. Uh, we should focus in on Europe a bit. We're like, okay, yeah, great. Let's revitalize this. Comes back from a meeting. Because remember when I told you I think there's light at the end of the tunnel? We're like, yeah. He goes, well, it's a freight train. It's <laughs> you're you're screwed because these guys don't want none. It's nothing to do. Oh with boy. You. So they they screwed the pooch. Uh, they didn't like the fact that I was doing all these interviews and they were asking because the label was saying that you know we were too scary, you know, and all all just all this bullshit because they didn't want to admit any of the problems that had happened with their business and the distribution and Marco, well, this, the label manager getting fired and all of that mess that was happening behind the scenes. So they just said that, yeah, no, we, we, we put this stuff out and the kids, meanwhile, we got 120 ads at radio the first week. We were getting all these requests at MTV. We we're doing all this touring. We're out there with, <laughs> we went out with kiss and it was so funny because Gene Simmons, the way we got on the KISS tour was um, Winger had to go back in the studio because the label didn't think they had a strong enough single. So they had written another song that they loved. So they were going to drop off the tour, go back in the studio, record the song, make it the single, put out the record, and then jump back on. Okay. So that left, that left like a six, eight-week window. That's um, the Hot in the Shade like a, tour like a, in 1991. Like a hot in the Shade, exactly. So we go out there, and we're doing our whole thing, and Gene's like, you know, going, well, what's with the goatees? And what's with the, you look like a bunch of grimy bikers. And look you don't at him get two it. years later. Right. See, that's the thing. He's like, I remember bumping into him going, what the fuck is with, with the little fur donut on your face, dude? He's like, well, well, everybody's wearing them. And I'm like, yeah, but you gave me shit for it a year ago, you know? So anyway, so Gene Simmons just hears that Winger's dumb. They went in and they knocked it right out. And they're like, now, meanwhile, when Winger dropped off the tour, it was us, Slaughter, and Kiss. Mm-hmm. Now, Gene would never admit it publicly, but Winger and Slaughter were the draw. They were the ones bringing in the bodies because they were current and on MTV all the time. So when Winger dropped off, ticket sales went into the toilet. And they were canceling shows left and right and all this kind of nonsense. So Gene decided to blame it on us. <laughs> he needs to get us off the tour and get Winger back on. So he calls up Jimmy Ivey, and I, I remember this. This is one of the best lines I've ever heard. God bless Gene. He goes, yeah, we got to take your boys off the tour. They're really not going over well. Now, remember, this is before the internet. So, now, Did you guys go on after Slaughter or before? You guys no, were both kind of new. Half the nights, they would, tickets would say doors at 7. Gene would put us on at 645. Oh, okay. I mean – it was it oh was, really does that happen a lot oh yeah especially with gene okay we never never got a sound check we got a sound check the first night never got a sound check uh never got full pa never got full lights i've missed a lot of opening acts going to kiss shows yes so you know so all this is going on and meanwhile we're we're getting we're getting reports back from Geffen's publicity department that the reviews in the newspaper the next day are raving that we were the band to go see. We're the future of rock. It's back to honesty. It's guys that can really play and really sing and blah, blah, blah. All this great stuff. Gene's telling people that the band's getting booed off stage. And it's like, what are you talking about? And Jimmy's like, I think I think I know what's going on here. He needs to bring Winger back on. So he gets Gene on the phone and Gene goes, yeah. They're going over like pork chops at a bar mitzvah. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's a great line, dude. I got to remember that one. Uh, so, yeah, so we did like six weeks with him. And between that and Gene knowing that everything was falling apart behind us at the label, okay. that it just all went into the toilet and it never, ever got back on track. So it was a million little mistakes, battles of the ego, I mean, they were, and the other thing was, is, you know, expectations lead to disappointments. Everybody said we would go platinum in like five minutes. And here the band is going, listen, that's all hype and bullshit, man. Until we sell records, we're just, a, we're just a bunch of grubby dudes from LA, man. This yeah. is, this is all, you guys are circle jerking each other into, this is going to be huge. And it, it's no. And they tried it like the, the guy that, that got fired um he decided now remember this is just as just as nirvana is really starting to break no rock band had ever gotten on top 40 before crossed over 
And and the guy running the show, who you know was high on fucking ecstasy and cocaine, that wind up getting fired. He decided he was going to take Little Caesar and break us at top forty, like six minutes after we were released. So at this time, all the big radio stations were like syndicated, like Z Rock, and yeah, there was all these conglomerates, and they were all behind the band, and they all added us into into heavy rotation. And when it started to take off in the first few weeks. This label manager wound up saying, I'm going to cross these guys over to like fucking like top 40 stations with a ballad. And as soon as he started that, all of those rock stations dropped us. They're like, you greedy bastards. You're acting like you don't need us anymore. And you're going to. And they were really offended. And it pissed a lot of these PDs, these program directors off. What song did they use? Um, well, it was Chain of Fools, and then we were going to come out with, um, well, this was, it was the big battle. It was either going to be In Your Arms or From the Stars. But at this point, the label's coming on us trying to blame it on our look. So we, mm-hmm. we shaved off our goatees and put on frilly shirts, and we did a photo shoot. And then it was hysterical because they, 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 then they decided, okay, they went with a song From the Start. They wouldn't put our picture on the promo CD so that the PDs at these top 40 stations wouldn't see we look like Charles Manson. So um, they send the track out and it all starts getting added and they try to do a concurrent release with In Your Arms. And they got us on like all of these easy listening stations, Mm. soft rock. And then they saw they it was even in Billboard. They posted a picture of us going, you know, rock band from LA, you know, on Geffen is getting traction at top 40, really breaking the rules. Look what they look like. And as soon as they posted the picture of us looking like we were going to a, you know, a chainsaw massacre, they, <laughs> they, they all dropped us at top 40. They didn't uh, even know what we look like. So it was just, again, it, it lit me of all of these things that happened in the music business behind the scenes yeah. of people in power during a time that, you know, that it was so much nonsense going on and we knew that music would have to change. You know, this is right before the alternative explosion. We were playing them like sound garden tracks telling them, listen, this is the kind of sound we want to go for. And they're looking at us like we're nuts. You know, <laughs> we're like, no man, this is going to be the future of this stuff. That Nirvana record you think is only going to sell 30,000 records. We want to go back and record the record like that. That's the record we were talking about. And they're like, no, 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 no. And then sure enough, you know, hindsight is pure sight, you know. And so, but by then everything was so in the toilet. There was so much bad blood, so much animosity, so much money spent that there was no way we were getting out of the hole. And that was it, you know. So, listen, for me, if if it would have happened the way they all thought it was going to happen, I'd either be dead or a raging asshole. So, uh, I'm, okay. I'm fine with it, but it's just funny. It's that's just pretty self aware. What's that? That's pretty self aware. Oh yeah. Well, I I wound up, you know, when all of this shit went down, I wound up deciding, you know, oh poor Ron, he didn't get to become the <laughs> rock star that they promised. So Ron's going to become a heroin addict for seven years. Oh know? really? So, huh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I crawled into a big ball of tar heroin for seven years. And, um, yeah, wound up going to rehab and getting my shit together. But yeah, you know, it's like, so everything happens for a reason. You know, I still get to play with my brothers and make music and and I have the respect of some of my peers and a lot of critics. We were never assholes. We were never, you know, it could have went to our heads. It never did. We're just a good working class band of of really good guys. And so it's great. You know, years later, we still get to do it. So we're, we're really grateful. The, the, the debut uh, full length record that is at the, especially at that time was something that when it went in I basically listened to the whole thing. Uh, Drive it home still hits my playlist, and I, I've always thought that uh, your rendition of "I Wish It Would Rain," um, if I if I was to like play somebody, this is what Ron Young sounds like. That would be like a great uh, version just to uh, showcase your voice. I don't know. Thanks. That's one of my favorites. I mean. You know, there was so many. Uh, that's the thing. I we've toyed around with thinking of re-recording that first record that sometimes people do, and it's like, yeah, why bother? But yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of stuff that, um, you know, it, it's just showing your roots and showing where you come from, and 
you know, we, we, we did a really, it was, it was like giving birth to a watermelon with razor blades sideways, that first record. <laughs> and, and the funny thing is like, you mentioned the EP, that was another whole contrived piece of bullshit. Um, really? Well, the, when, when we had to wait the year and a half for Bob Rock and, and John Kalodner to patch up their relationship and he'd booked like two other records and we had to wait. Um, they went to metal blade to Brian Slago. I said, listen, we need to get something on them. We need to get like a street buzz. And this worked really well for Guns N' Roses. Let's do the same thing and make it look like, so all we did was we took some demos from songs that we knew were not going to be on the record. And we put the demos together on like five tracks or whatever and put it out through Metal Blade to just start getting something on the street. And the funny thing is, man, is that that nice little label that Brian's got over there, they did more for us. And they were more honest, and they got the band way more than Geffen ever did. And, hmm. and I wish we would have put the record out with them, you know, did a record with them, for them. Um, and it's like, as soon as we went over to Geffen, we're like, this is a clusterfuck. That, that little Metal Blade record is, label is, is more got their shit together with better people who are more committed and passionate to the music. And, yeah, they might be some, not, might be some huge mega corporation, but they're the real deal. You know, but the state would have it. No, but yeah, that was a total contrived bullshit thing. You did manage to put one more record out on DGC. How how did how the hell did Earl Slick get into the picture? Oh, it's funny. Um, Lauren knew him um, from doing stuff with Dirty White Boy. He was he was in between records and bands. He wasn't doing the Bowie thing anymore. He got canned from that, and. You know, at this point, the band is just totally, I'm doing heroin. This is my beginning of my heroin use. And mm. the band's all bitter and angry and sad. And so we decided to hire another bitter, angry, sad guitar player that really <laughs> fit right in. And that whole thing, you know, we, we got to work he with He was Howard much Benson. older than you, if, if I, right? Or Yeah, yeah. He, you know, yeah, he was, he was about 10 years older. Okay. And then we, you know, we got to work with Howard Benson, which was kind of cool. You know, Howard went on to have him, is having a huge career. Um, and again, at that point, man, it was all, we were all like, what are we doing? Why are we even bothering? We know that this is just, to, they have to, we, they have to make, let us make another record for the contract. We knew as soon as it was done, they were going to drop us. Mm. And, and it was really because we did weird, the record. Man. Yeah, it was just a really weird time. This is when we were working with Herbie Herbert, and he's like, dude, they're not going to let this thing even see the light of day. They're just going to spend the money, do the record, write you off on the on the balance sheet, but I don't see them putting any money behind this record. And I was like, well, what about going over to Europe? We, we've, you know, they get bluesy stuff over there way more than they get it here, and, and the fans over there have a different mindset. And that whole industry is disconnected from what we went through here. What if we try there? And they're like, well, why don't you guys, let's book a few shows. Let's go over there and do it. So we booked a show at the Marquee in London at uh, the Mark Tala Theater in, um, in Hamburg. And we did the Bulldog Bash, which is a Hells Angels um, festival uh, that goes on up, up in the middle of England, where we're actually Stratford upon Avon, Shakespeare's hometown, 50,000 people. So we go over there and, you know, we're still all kind of, yeah, okay, let's see if this does anything. And the, the marquee, we show up and there's a line double around the block. Wow. We, we sold out the show. It was off the, off the hook. It was absolutely nuts. And the label manager over there was like this woman and she was like, Wow. She goes, that was one of the best shows I've ever seen. And the audience went nuts. We really should jump on this record here. And I'll talk to the guys over in Europe and let's resurrect this thing. Let's take this record and pick up and start afresh. And this is influence. Like, yeah, this is on influence. Okay. And it was funny because the guys from Thunder, that band Thunder, yep. were in the audience that night. So I get back to the hotel the next morning, the phone rings early and it's, it was a singer from Thunder. And at this point, this is just when Monsters of Rock, you know, shows were going on over in, in and they were headlining that. 
because they, okay. they were huge with that song Dirty Love. And they yep. were really big over in Europe. And they're like, we get to pick and choose who's on the lay, on the bill. We'd love for you guys to come and do do these festivals with us. And we're like, okay, great. You know, 50 to 70,000 people a night. That's great. He's like, yeah, well, most bands, all these bands are paying us money to get on the tour, but we'll, we'll waive that. You guys just get there and you can be on the tour. And we're like, okay, great. We call back to Geffen in the States. Mm-hmm. We go, listen, all we need is like 10 grand a week tour support. They're like, no. We're like, what? We're going to play to 50 to 70,000 people a night. And you don't think it's worth 10 grand a week? And they said, no. So I called up Herbie and I'm like, dude, this is ridiculous. He goes, I told you, they want this to just go away. So I call up the guy from Thunder. I go, dude, they won't even give us a tour support. He goes, how about if we give you like five, 600 bucks a night? So it went down to like five grand a week. I called them up. They said, no. And that's when we knew this is over. Wow. This is, this is over. What a business model. Yeah, oh, yeah, man. Nah, it, listen, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. All these egos, all this crap behind the scenes. It, it's it's, And a lot of these guys, at this point, this is when accountants were running the business yeah. and lawyers. It was no more of the old school. The non-creators. Yeah, the non-creators. The guys who get caught up in their own image. and you know, It's probably even worse now with social media. You know, these people thinking that they're influencers and all this crap. But <laughs> whatever, man. You know, it's been a wild ride. It's been a lot of fun. Learned a lot of things. Got to, got to have some amazing experiences. And I still get to do it. It's, it's, it's fun. Did you guys have like a just a, a a hardcore breakup or was it kind of a fade away kind of situation? No, it was. We just sat in the room going, well, I don't know about you guys, but... <laughs> This is going nowhere. We're going to go need, need to go get jobs yeah. because the label ain't giving us no money. And this is the weird, but this is the final. This is the final thing that pushed me into my addiction was uh, got a phone call from Herbie and he goes, well, listen, your contract is the option is up in two weeks and they want to have a meeting. And I was like, OK, I'm like, will they let us out? Go, go somewhere else. He goes, that's what I'm thinking. He goes, because I've called around. And basically, Atlantic, Electra, Epic, they all want you. If you're going to come free, clear, no, they'll start from scratch with you guys. Um, they all, these are all the labels that were bidding on you when you first got signed. They're still interested. They still see the band's credibility and talent, potential. Okay, great. So we go to have this meeting, and there's David Geffen and Eddie Rosenblatt and all these assholes sitting around the room. And David comes in and he goes, listen, this is the deal. I collect artists like I collect my artwork. Now, you remember that battle with Neil Young? Didn't do a record for 10 years when he was on my label? Yeah. Well, who do you think won that battle? And I was like, well, uh, it's a subjective decision. But yeah. he goes, and then he listed all these people he's had battles with that he always wins. He goes, this is what we're going to do. I'm, gonna, I'm not picking up the option. I'm going to let you guys go. But I know there's a bunch of labels that want to pick it up, but I can't let you reform and go on to Atlantic or Epic or Electra because you're going to make my business look bad if they break you. It's going to be obvious that we screwed the pooch on this and it was not the band. So I'm going to hold you, and he points to me, in the key man clause on the contract. You're going to stay signed to me. And you'll probably never put out a record, but you can bring me some stuff. And if it's really good, I'll think about it. Uh, But this needs to just go away because it makes my business look bad. You opened up your mouth to too many reporters. You told too many truths about what was going on. You made me look bad. I don't forget these things. You didn't play along, even though I'm like, wow. So he said, you can either sign this thing saying you won't reform. And that's what he did. So we, we couldn't we couldn't reform and go somewhere else. So. We've all been great friends and family members and godparents to our, each other's kids and all this stuff over the years. But, yeah, we basically – that's when I decided I'm going to call the heroin dealer. My life's in the fucking shitter. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah, but that's the way this business works, man. It's really bad. Do you still have the abs from the back cover of Influence? Um. Not quite the six pack, <laughs> there, but yeah, I still have a nice flat stomach. I'm just not one of those. Okay, I'm sure if I worked on it for a few months, I could get them all back. But no, it's just a nice flat stomach with a little lumps, but not quite the definition of my youth. <laughs> oh, so. what, since we're talking, little Caesar, why? What about reuniting? What what brought all that about? 
um, you know, we were all just talking with each other and we missed playing with each other and hanging out. So we said, okay. And we, we made a promise that we were going to do it. But none of the bullshit wasn't about money. It was just about the music. And we started to do some shows around LA. And then the next thing you know, the internet was just getting started and we started to get, you know, being able to hear from fans over in, in the UK and Europe. Mm-hmm. And so we've kind of, I mean, that's really where we've been focusing over the last like seven, eight, nine years. We go over there a couple of times a year and, you know, it's a packed out clubs yeah. and we do it for like a month. Everybody takes off of work and uh, we go play rock star for a month and come home and nurse our colds and put, <laughs> put salve on our arthritis and, <laughs> and go, why are we doing this? Oh my God, this is kicking our ass. But it's so much fun, man. I mean, you know, to be able to, to be able to get in a room, you, you know, we never charge for meet and greets or any of that. Yeah. And you actually mentioned that on your Facebook page, you kind of took shots at bands and you were talking more about bands at your level. Like you understand why, I don't know, the like Kiss or somebody like that. Like they would get mobbed if they just went out to the merch table. But uh, you guys like you, you know what I mean? Uh, you you, ha- you think that's kind of bullshit? I, I do. I mean, I I don't think it's fair for guys to monetize the passion of the fans. Um, I, I hence have evolved my impression of this, especially because a bunch of my friends gave me real shit. Pers- uh, publicly and privately mm, about okay. it because they do it and what i've come to find is that there's some bands that really put a lot of energy into making it a valuable experience okay. and give the fans something worth the money and then there's those that just do some half-ass take a quick picture take your money and and screw off you know and they do it begrudgingly and those are the guys that really piss me off and that's actually more the majority than not but there are guys like jason beeler he, he gave me some serious shit about it go oh, man I do all this and I do all that for you to bag on that. Make me look like, and I was like, okay. And, I, and publicly i made an apology. You know? He's a cool guy, um, by the way. He's a very cool guy. So publicly made an apology to him that uh, I was wrong to lump everybody into that, you know, to cast that too broad of a net. But for us, uh, like I say, we don't do this for the money. We do this, you know, because our, our fans are our lifeblood, you know, without fans, we're just a bunch of guys jerking off in a rehearsal room in LA. You know? So, um, right. We try to on, we try to honor that relationship. Um, we just go out every night, and for however long people are there, want to get stuff signed or tell a story or get a picture, we do it. You know, so it's it it's great. And you've released s- some amazing music since that time. Um, I actually, it does seem like you guys have found your sweet spot. Now I, I, I redemption and eight, um, I think are just, they're both fabulous records. I, for somehow I missed American dream. Um, and I'm a guy who kind of pays attention. So I was actually listening to that just, uh, about leading up to us talking today. Uh, the, the stuff I heard, I loved and it, it kind of fell. It seems like you guys have hit your sweet spot. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, when, when, when you get all the people that are a hindrance out of your way, you know, uh, those records are way more the kind of records we always wanted to make. Unfortunately, now when we go in and do these things, they're really hasty. You know, we did all three of those records in like 21 days from getting sounds to mixing it down. And that's a little more rushed than I'd like to do it, but I'd still rather do a record that way than the Bob rock, let's spend 53 hours on one solo, you know, (laughs) it's like, that's just not music to me, but, um, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, the nice thing is we, you know, we, we never relied on, we always wanted to be showing our influences, you know, hence why the second record was called influence, Yeah, you know, to the, to the sixties and seventies that led up to blues based hard rock music and the originators of that and soul of Motown and blues. And then the white guys, British guys, teenagers with long hair that took that and amplified it and created some of the greatest music of all time. The Zeppelins and the who's and the bad companies and the Sabbaths and all these other things. And so we, we never, you know, we always got lumped in with these L.A. strip hair bands, and we're not one of those bands. And just because we came from L.A., we've been always fighting that albatross label. And, you know, the thing that we never broke new ground when we were starting the band. We've always just 
do a country flavored song or a blues flavored song or a punk flavored song. And it's, a, it allows us a freedom where there's a lot of other bands from that period of time, LA guns and bullet boys and all this. And when they, if they put out a record and it doesn't sound like an eighties record, it sounds really weird to the hmm. listener. And so they, they, they have a little bit more of a hindrance on an evolutionary music scale than we would have, because we've always tried to just be a very, straight ahead and you know after the first record the records were a lot more organic and small and honest so we just keep that going it's just rock and roll man it, it ain't if you're listening if you're listening for something that's groundbreaking don't pick up a little caesar record and you go find <laughs> it you know it's no just, you're sticking true to kind of a, a, a good formula and you're just putting your own spin on it and, and yeah it's very I mean, authentic when i listen to it Thank you. I, that's important to me, and I'm glad that that comes across. I just want honesty. Like it or don't like it, that's great, but it will strike you, hopefully, as being honest and sincere. Uh, you know, we're not the greatest songwriters of all time, but I think hmm. we're a lot better than other people. We understand what it means to have a good hook and a decent arrangement, and, you know, we have great singers in the band, so the background vocals are always really good, cool. and you just get a good guitar sound, and there you go. It's a rock and roll record, man. It, it's just, <laughs> you know, this and, isn't prog rock. You know? Did you feel a bit like uh, you were uh, forecasting the future with the lyrics to American Dream? It seems very timely right now. Yeah, it's funny. You know, we caught a lot of shit for that. And the last video we just released about a month ago caught a lot of shit from people because uh, I kind of, they don't like, some people don't like looking in the mirror, man, you mm -hmm. know? And it's like we did American Dream and I just grabbed all of these. All I did was I did a, a Google search on American Dream. And I just started grabbing photos and videos that I saw. And that's the content of the, of, I let the Google algorithm decide what nice. the American dream meant. And if you go 20, 30 pages in and you see these, you know, race, race related issues and money related issues and obesity and all of this stuff that, and I just use that to make it statement one way or the other, man. And some people it's amazing the different interpretations people take depending on their mindset and oh you, you know, couldn't have said so, that better you know so it, it's i mean how many cock rock songs can you write you know i mean it's like at some point you got to be an adult and say something i mean I, I i go through this all the time on social media people are like well just shut up and make music man you know Bullshit. and it's like well yeah, I'm like seriously. Those same are, people are posting their thoughts on political shit left and right. The problem is they don't agree with what you're saying. That's the problem. When they don't like what they hear, then they tell you to shut up. And yeah. it's like, I'm sorry, man, but you know, music should be a voice of change. Great art should make you think, and it mm -hmm. should make you. It should motivate you, and it should bring things to light. That's the '60s was a great example of that. You know, and I'm sorry if you don't like it, but. On the other side of the coin, and, and I, it's funny because Facebook's always been my social experiment. My personal page, I don't post anything political on the fan page, on the band page. Yeah, that's, right. that's not the – just here's the music. Here's where we're coming from. Just I, – I don't do that. I don't think it's crossing – piercing the veil. But on my personal page, you know, I'm at the max 5,000 limit for, a, for an individual, <laughs> and I always watch. I sneaked how many in a friends, few years back. How many how many friends I lose depending on the posts that I make, and I gotta say because I've really tried to make my page a forum for people to have good, honest, open discussion respectfully, and so I'm always getting these things. How could you let this guy say this and let that guy say that? And I'm like, I think the more you see the stupidity in someone's point of view, that's what social media should be about. Mm -hmm. It should be awakening to people. This is how this kind of person thinks or this kind of person thinks. And if I just post cat videos, no one's going to ever get that discussion going. Oh, someone's I love, I love cat videos. I mean, too. I post <laughs> them all the time. You know, here's a cat in a MAGA hat. Here's a liberal <laughs> cat. Here's a Black Lives Matter cat, you know. Um, oh, I don't like that. But, you know, but the thing is, it's like I, I just – and I try to do it with some sort of satire or humor so that you don't go crazy with this stuff. If you, if you don't, if you lose your sense of humor, you're going to lose your mind, you know? So I always try to put some sort of humorous spin on it, some satirical, insightful, trying to be a humorist, not just a ranter and a raver. Sure. And, you know, I, 
I don't know if somebody just died and closed off their Facebook account, but I'll lose maybe one or two people every couple of weeks. Considering if you're going to throw some Molotov cocktails, if you're going to lose two out of 5,000 people, you obviously must be doing something right. Because Mm -hmm. as, as even when people totally disagree with it, they start to see the comments or they make a comment and I don't come back going, well, fuck you. Or I start to engage them and I do it respectfully and I let them have their voice. So they at least feel they're not changing my mind, but they're respected and they're heard. And that's, what's missing from our social discourse. Now we're not listening to each other anymore. We're being at least open-minded to go, well, you made a good point there, or I never saw it that way there or this is where I disagree and this is why here's some learned information to back up my claim and not just post some conspiracy YouTube theory or something, you know, and it seems to work. And so uh, to me, that's the the benefit of social media is getting to people besides my fans and friends and family and everything is to have a little fun and have a little discussion, lucid adult debate. It's all good. You know, I think you do a really good job of, of not taking a, a hard stance like black and white, hard, right, good, left, bad, or vice versa, right? But something tells me that I guarantee you've been called both, you know, a right-wing nut and a left-wing snowflake. Oh, I know. Because you've I'm been called moderate. both, right? Yeah, I've been a moderate. I piss off my liberal friends and I piss off my conservative friends. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but tell me where, tell me what I'm saying here is not at least a reasonable point of view. Yeah. Well, now, you you like to shoot guns effect. and you don't want people to die from COVID. Exactly right. I want people, I own an arsenal of weaponry. You can anal check me on a background check all you want. I don't feel that that's a violation of my rights. And I think that the more somebody, you know, the, if you're going to have all of this stuff out there, try to be responsible in who yeah. you let have it. I think that's the counterbalance, you know. And so people, you know, they, they don't know what to make of stuff like that. Or like I'll post something about, you know, the Democrats showing up in African garb for a photo, you know, and calling them out on really, yeah, no really? Shit. Nancy Pelosi, you're now like King Botswana over here. I mean, come on, man. You guys are really virtue signaling out the yin yang here. And it really pisses people off. And so I, I call out the craziness on both sides, but nowadays there's a lot more coming from the White House than there is from the other side. Now, don't you miss those days when it was a little more balanced, <laughs> like yes, crazy from everywhere? I, right? I do. <laughs> I miss the days of compromise and debate and discussion uh, and people not just labeling things they don't like as fake because it, they don't like it. You know, I mean, seriously, I've noticed on. the people that support the most divisive rhetoric are just recently talking about, we need to stop being so divisive by the way, Trump 2020. Right. Exactly. It's just like, right. They, they don't, they don't want to see. And, and I get it. You know what, man, listen, the only thing Americans love more than building somebody up is tearing them down. Yeah. And that's part of our culture. Um, it's getting to the point now where uh, I think there's so many people that are so in, they went so far in on supporting this guy that they've lost their objectivity as to what's completely inappropriate to be said or done anymore. And, and, and that's too bad. It is too bad because, you know, if you can't, if you can't call out the team that, that you believe in, they're going to continue doing it. And unfortunately this particular character under the guise of, well, he's a disruptor, or that's not what he meant to say, or he's not a politician. Bullshit to all of the above. I'm sorry. He's, you know, when you, when you come out there and out of the blue at three in the morning, start calling out Bubba Wallace because the noose was fake. And I mean, my stance on that was, well, it was really screwed up, you know? Okay. Then it comes out. It was, it was just a coincidence. Okay, still I'll wrong. post the article about it being about it not being what it thought to be, even though I, I, I have no problem saying I'm wrong. I wish the president would try that sometimes. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, people will do that to me all the time going, no, nah, dude, you need to read this. This is and I'm like, oh, wow. OK, I didn't know that that was the case. I'm wrong. My apologies. I feel like a better person when I say that. You know, what's so hard about saying, okay, new material has come to light 
or new investigations show this. And I go, oh, that's wrong. That's bad. Not good. I'm an adult. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I do. I that. do share some political stuff on my Facebook page. I've tried to kind of tone it back a little bit, but it, with the, the George Floyd stuff, I felt a certain obligation to get kind of back in the game. But to your point, Anytime I, I, I do post something that turns out to be a little inaccurate, I, I try to either delete it or, or, or show a correction right. of some sort and kind of admit like, hey, well, this is what I knew at the time. And it kind of, exactly what you're just saying. I really you couldn't be more right, Ron. It just 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 own it. Yeah. And, and this, you know, the swinging all the way, you know, it's like all oh, the all lives matter. And it's like eh, you don't understand that when you say stuff like that, why it, it makes these other people feel once again, marginalized, mm-hmm. is it so hard to, I mean, that's just the, like these people have gone to the point where if you support something, it's like with supporting the president, you've got to be all in a hundred percent, no deviation. And I'm like, okay, we can talk about, okay. I'm old enough to remember when I was a really little kid sitting in New York city, eating my TV dinner, watching the black and white with the aluminum foil coat hanger antenna watching black people getting dogs sicked upon them and hoses shot at them for trying to get a a lunch in the south at a whites only counter Mm -hmm. now i'm sorry but the the money that went into their neighborhoods the schools that they got the all of that stuff the housing they were allowed to it is it has been a detriment to them on an equality level does that mean I think we should write them ten billion dollar checks in reparations? No, I don't. But a little honesty to own that reality will go a lot further mm-hmm. than swinging the gate the other way. And you know, like these photos of white people with like their hands tied and a shirt that says "I'm sorry." It's like, oh my god, your white guilt. That's like so ridiculous. And so the the, the the 180 degree swing of the mm-hmm. gate is is what's killing this country from both sides of the equation. Some of the things I see the Democrats do, I'm like, oh my god, you pandering assholes! It's well, like, the Dixie Chicks just changed your name to the Chicks. Oh my god! Yeah, so they go from <laughs> they, so they have a name that's comprised of potentially a racist term and a sexist term, and they choose to get rid of the racist one and just focus on the sexist one. Oh, yeah. Like really... Did, didn't I happen to see your dog's name's Dixie? Yes, my dog's name is Dixie. And I mean, so still? Like, my wife is like, Let's, should we not tell people her name? I'm like, shut the fuck up. Oh, like, like, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's unbelievable. The, the, just the extremes that people go to to try to, you know, okay, and I even posted about this. It's like, okay, so we're going to ban Aunt Jemima on the cover of the pancake batter. But if you look at the ingredients, there's like seven chemicals in there that are making people obese and unhealthy. They don't get to that sort of we got to. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we have to correct that injustice for society. No, they glaze right over that and want to go for the branding. I mean, someone's got to call out the hypocrisy about that. Or you look like you've drank the Kool-Aid as much as the other side. You know what I mean? It's like, right. come on, man. And then these people go, OK, well. I can at least have a discussion with this guy and it'll be respectful and I'll get to to tell him my point of view and he'll tell me his. And at the end of the day, even when it gets really heated in the course of the discussion, I hear they got a cold. I'll write him back the next day. How are you feeling today? And they're like, really? We were just yelling at each other. I'm like, yeah, (laughs) about politics. But as a human being, how are you feeling today? Yeah. And they're like, wow. And I'm like, yeah, it's cool. It shouldn't be that revolutionary. No, I mean, we live in a country together, man. It's like I would take a bullet to defend your right to be able to wear that stupid fucking hat. <laughs> I wish I didn't, but that's the way this all works, man. <laughs> it's like it, it, it's got to be that we stand up for each other. Now, we got to get rid of all of the hype and the bullshit, but I get it. Right now, people are all in. They got to be all in. Because the guy that they're supporting is so out there. And, I mean, we're, we're in the middle of this giant virus. And we're in the middle of all of this civil unrest. Yeah. And all he does is get up on the 4th of July. The one day it should be about history and unite, uniting each other and remembering. And all he wants to talk, he ignores even talking about the virus. 
He doesn't, he, he, all he wants to do is solidify his base. And it's like, this guy is not good for everyone in this country. The two party system and the dual voices, this is what has kept our country alive and thriving because we have to make compromise mm -hmm. and we have to hear other people's point of view and, and to respect that these other people have a different lifestyle or concern or experiences that has changed their way of thinking. But all of this has gotten to the point where now science doesn't matter and truth doesn't matter and investigations don't matter and accountability doesn't matter. It's all thrown out the window. And that ain't good for in the big picture of things. And I'm hoping it changes. I'm not thrilled about the choices we have yet again. Yeah, no shit. But, you know. How about this? If you want to put a positive spin on the political side, if you're a Trumper, who who needs a reason to bail on Trump? Like, think about this. In four years, you're going to have a pretty easy candidate to beat. Yeah. You go back to the you know, Republican thinkers. Like, I don't yeah, know. I, that's the best I could do. You're asking people to make a really big stretch to, to open up their consciousness and acceptance. <laughs> These people are not good at acceptance. Um, no, not I, at it's, all. It's, it's really quite incredible i just went through this whole debate where you know it was about the hydroxychloroquine yeah. thing and the guy's like talking about you know well hey you know this virus is just going to do what it's going to do and blah 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 and i'm like well you know you hate this guy cuomo in new york he's been totally honest he's he's come out and said every day where he screwed up He's come out every yes. day and owned it. said, if you're angry at somebody, be angry at me. But I'm doing what I have to do for everybody to be better. And this is going to be painful, but this is the hard task. I'm going to do it. And then lo and behold, everything he's done has been exactly like every other responsible country or government. And he got it down to like after this wildfire, got it down to working where now he can start to reopen everything and heal from it. And all these people want to focus in on this. Well, he sent people to nursing homes and that killed him and it's like yep and he's admitted that that wasn't the best choice but at the time blah 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 that's the kind of guy i would rather see on the helm of power than the people you support because it is complicated and you know what i don't believe it's trump's fault that the economy's in the tank he didn't create that i think he's made it worse yeah but i don't Agreed. hold him accountable for a virus I hold him accountable for the results from the response to the virus now. There we go. But you have to keep that stuff in mind. But to say that it's us the bad cold or it's the Democratic hoax or all this other litany of bullshit that people have been throwing out there to give this guy a pass yeah. because he was overwhelmed and he decided to roll the dice and not listen to his experts because he wants his numbers to be good to win an election. Well, dude, that's just not realistic. And you screwed the pooch, and now the numbers show it. Own it already. The sooner you do, the better off we'll be. But I no, agreed. Uh, I actually would prefer every elected official never have to have a representative of them ever remind the people that that elected official does know how to read. Right. Uh, so uh, I think that should be the litmus test. If your press secretary has to go out there and say the, the president does know how to read, Right. Uh, if that was even Hello. a question. Uh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it's like, really, do you realize how low the bar has fallen now? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Do you I really, I really hope uh, we're not pissing too many people off with this, but whatever. I just Well, we, we could be. And, and again, I we're not discussing policy. We're discussing exactly. personality. And the fact of the matter is, is I also believe we need a strong border security. Every country, especially in these times, needs to be able to regulate who comes in and out of their country for safety reasons, drugs, terrorism, and, and just the overall safety. Pandemic. Now, people take that as, oh, so you're for the wall. No, I'm not. I think that's the stupidest fucking idea. Fifth century technology in what, the 21st century. What did you century. say? Don't build it and then there won't be anybody climbing over it or something like right. that? Right. Well, that was, yeah, the joke compared to the, if you yeah. don't test, you don't yeah, know this right. virus out there. <laughs> I'm not pregnant because I, mean, I didn't take a pregnancy is, test. It's absolutely incredible. That kind of, I mean, my a five-year-old could, could would say that and, and I would think it was funny, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, it's like, well, if you don't buy them any toys, then none of them can break. It's like, it's like, really? That, that's just ridiculous. But 
so yeah, I believe in border security. I believe that that you know that we we need us we need police departments. They need to be reformed. We need to get rid of a lot of the mentality. It, there's a whole lot of things that I don't think that Republicans and right wing people are off the mark. There's things that need to be dealt with. Sure, how no. we do that, but that is, is that gets is, back is to what I was trying discussion. to say earlier. Let, let's shift the conversation back to policy and not about like, can you believe what this idiot just said right. or tweeted? Why is that such a, a a goal that we don't all want? The dumbest yeah. of of society should push for that. Anyway, I sorry. I, yeah, no, yours. it's it's. Listen, I get it. If you say anything bad, then it looks like you're a turncoat and and you're jumping on the the, the bandwagon of piling on this guy. But I'm sorry, but I don't the, feel that know, way. Thing, I think it, the, we're just pointing out either. logic. He's he's got to be accountable. And I'm sorry, but some of the things that come out of his mouth, which is what he's using, it's an insight into his thought process that then develops the policy that he instills. And so we need to call that out right now. It's like I'm sorry, but. Uh, you can't you can't wrap yourself in this in, in in having the base of people that are overtly or covertly or ignorantly racist hmm. because they're either haven't been around other cultures because they live in some rural area. I, I don't think and this is where the left goes wrong, always yell telling everybody they're a racist because Correct. they forget that okay, well what you just said was insensitive doesn't mean you want to lynch black people it just means dude you haven't been you haven't been exposed to enough black culture and their experience to make a statement like that and have it be a, 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 a lucid thing to say hmm. so let's talk about that so you're made aware of this this and this because i know in your heart you're not a racist you're just being ignorant to reality as i am about maybe military policy and yeah i grew up in new york city I grew up in the time when they started busting black kids into my white neighborhood and, and the cultural shift and the things I learned and the, the, the open mindedness I had to have because I was living a sheltered life made me a better person. Hmm. I was just ignorant. But at the time I was the president of my, I was elected to be president of my junior high school. They started busting kids in. Aww. Everybody was talking. All of the, all of the Italians and all these white people that lived in my neighborhood said there was going to be these race riots at a, at a middle school. They were like twelve <laughs> year olds. You know? like, I mean, nobody knew or cared, but it trickled down from the parents to the kids. So I went to school one day with a big my Boy Scout Bowie knife strapped to my ankle, and someone saw it sticking out of my sock. And I they took they took my office away. I was impeached, and the cops came and. My parents had to come down and, you know, and they're like, why did you do that? So, well, I heard there's going to be a race riot or something. And I'm like, well, what does that mean to you? And I'm like, I don't know what that means. And I'm looking at the kid that sits next to me at the desk is this black kid, Mark Johnson. And, you know, I'm like, uh, I think we're supposed to fight each other. And he's like, why? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know? It's like. But it's amazing. And I learned that lesson really early on, man. It's like, get all worked up about this shit and it's like hey man you don't know you know i'm like how do you like coming to this school it's like wow man i gotta get on a bus and it's, it takes a lot longer <laughs> but it's it's a lot nicer school than what they had me in okay you know and it's like well there you go now you got some good teachers around you and funny years later i found him on facebook and he became a lawyer you know and mm. it's like who knows you know, and it's funny because I asked him and he said, well, yeah, his dad got arrested for selling drugs and, and because there was a war on drugs in the in the 70s and 80s in New York. Yeah. And so oddly enough, I'm, like, I'm sorry, but you can't go in to say, well, we're going to clamp down on the drugs in, in this in this urban project area of socioeconomically deprived people who don't have a good never got a good education and round up their fathers who are trying to provide for their family selling weed and then now they're a felon and if they lived in colorado they'd be an entrepreneur it's like there's something yeah. wrong with that you can't you gotta expunge the records or you gotta be do the right thing you gotta do the right thing and it's just funny because i look back on it it's like wow your dad was arrested for selling weed I sold weed for like six years, man. But in my neighborhood, there was no cops shaking down people every five minutes as they walked up the street. So I never got caught, you know. And 
we just have to own the reality of that. It doesn't mean you give away the keys to the store or you turn into some bleeding heart, no accountable. And then I'll post something like, hey, what if we started a, a, a works project again? These people want to get out of their situation. Teach them how to drive a bulldozer. Teach them how to program a computer and sustain them and then let them pay that back over time. And then you have a better productive citizen. You don't have somebody that joins a gang or anything. They see some light at the end of their tongue. Oh, and the liberals lose their mind. That's like slavery. No, it's not. <laughs> it's, just, it's like sending a kid to college and, and paying, you know, let them pay off his debt over 20 years. It's, but it's a win-win. You just keep, keep throwing money at poor people and thinking that's going to change your life. That doesn't work. Right. We prove that, you know, so, oh, you sound like some right wing nut. I'm like, really? <laughs> it's like I'm at least admitting there's a problem. I'm just talking about the subtleties of how do we try to change this, knowing we've tried this, this, this and this and it doesn't work anymore. You know, so sorry, but hey, at least I'm sitting there posting that Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I've got no problem supporting that. These videos show that these people have been, they've been fucked with for too long and they're pissed off and they have every right to say they're pissed off. Now, looting, that's a whole nother thing. We're starting to but find out a lot of that, though, is like uh, kind of agent provocateur type shit. Or they're yeah, just trying man. to, because to, to, I, I live here in, in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where that all that stuff recently just started, six miles from, from uh, where George Floyd was killed. Um, right. They are now, you're seeing, they're actually catching and arresting these people, and they right. are not the protesters. No, and that's the thing, you know, they want to lump everybody in. It's like, no, there's protesters and then there's rioters and there's looters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this whole... Well, yeah, we, all we're all supposed to believe it's, it's just like, one bad cop. It's like, no, right. And the same thing goes for the cops. It's like, listen, you gotta, there's a, we got to fix this because I know mm -hmm. a lot of cops. I know a lot of guys in the military. And it's like... Same here. The fact is, is that these cops, you can't speak up without catching shit. They've got this ridiculous union that protects even the bad ones. And a lot of this stuff needs to get cleaned up. And you need to support the good ones who would like to speak out against the bad ones. But the system has become this sort of cult of non, you know, you know, non uh, evaluation of these people and examination of them because it's either all or nothing. We can fix this, and it doesn't mean you got to defund them and start sending therapists out on domestic violence <laughs> charge calls. That's just ridiculous. So I don't know, man. It, it's it's become so crazy on both sides that yeah, I don't. Really I wish there was some lucid vision in the middle that can that can bring both sides together and go. Well, if we can accomplish this, but we do it like that, can you both live with that? And they go, okay, you know, yeah. Okay, so wait a minute. So we'll actually like secure the border with like sensors and <laughs> thousands of agents with body cams and technology and infrared. So you, you don't just want open borders. No, I don't want open borders. I just don't want to build some stupid wall a twelve year old can climb over in thirty yeah. seconds. It's yeah, like come ladders, on, tunnels, man. and it's planes. Just, Right. I mean, come on. You're not using your head here. You're just supporting a bumper sticker chant. Amen. That's, you know, ridiculous, man. It's easy to fit on a T-shirt, build a wall. Yeah. Hey, listen, as long as you can do that, then, then we're saved. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I, I, happy to do it, but we got way more political than this show ever does. And, Ron, this could not have been more enjoyable. I uh, well, Thank you. I, Same here. I had a pretty good idea that I was going to be uh, have a have a pretty good conversation with you, and uh, you owned up to your end. So hopefully, uh, I was okay on mine. So. You were, no, you were great, man. Very, very pleasurable to have adult conversations. That are in, <laughs> I don't know. get that a lot. I'm often called childish. Uh, well, well, then maybe maybe that's a reflection of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I maybe we're both cool. maturing too slow. <laughs> Honest to God, Ron, I, this is one of the best conversations I've had with anybody I've had on the show. I've wanted you on for a while, but I'm just glad we finally got it put together. So um, thank you no, for your time. You gave me a ton of it. Thank Holy you. crap. 
Yeah. <laughs> you have to split it up. Yeah. <laughs> Part no, two. No. Yeah, this is all going out in one lump. I don't care. Uh, yeah, but, hey, all the best. Stay safe out there, and uh, I appreciate everything you do, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep thumbs up and, and, and commenting every now and then on the things you post on Facebook. Thanks, Jason. Take all care, right. man. You too. Bye-bye.